My name is Miguel Ruggiero. I'm Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. This is Key Insights at AIBD 2017, and today we are discussing our program on novel targets for IBD therapy. Is this the final frontier? And joining me, and I have the pleasure of introducing Marla Dubinsky, Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, Marla, you gave a wonderful talk on Crohn's disease and treatment for Crohn's, not only current therapies, but future. Let's start. There was a lot of discussion about positioning current medicines in Crohn's disease. So before we get into some of the new treatments, tell us, how do you position treatment for Crohn's disease specifically? Thanks, Miguel, for uh, having me speak with you today about our symposium. It was really interesting because I think, as you noted, before we can kind of talk about the pipeline and what's next, we're just figuring out how to use our current therapies, particularly TNFs. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you know, we've had TNF around for almost 20 years now, and all I needed to state was that there is still a huge issue with loss of response, sometimes primary, which we're now beginning to feel maybe more of a PK issue, maybe or maybe not, versus a mechanism issue. And the idea that probably the dose is our major limitation, meaning us not understanding as much about the true dose for induction. I think less than maintenance. Right. I kind of feel like the magic is in induction as, a, as I'm playing around a little more with the dosing and some of our pharmacokinetic models that we have. But one of the things that I wanted to bring out in the lecture is that Yes, we have that as a background for TNF, and we didn't need to discuss all the indications. I think we were all very sure. well versed in how to use it in terms of what patient. But really, the idea that any biologic, whether it be vetalizumab or ustekinumab, I think the understanding the pharmacokinetics and the impact of the patient's individual characteristics still impacts dosing. Right. That's a little different than the small molecules. And, and before we get to the small molecules, I think, so you bring up an important point. So we have three anti-TNFs that are approved for Crohn's disease. We have vetalizumab, we have ustekimumab, and dosing, I agree. I think from the start, we probably maybe need higher doses to achieve higher PK. How do you position, or how do, when you have a Crohn's disease patient that you see who's naive to biologics, how are you positioning these different treatments at this point? So I think, I think I first look at the inflammatory burden and the speed for which I need a response. That still remains sometimes like my first thing. And if it's someone who I know I need rapid response, if I could use the right dosing, I'd have to be honest that infliximab tends to be my go-to drug for severe perianal disease, bad deep ulcers in the left colon rectum. Um, long segment small bowel disease in pediatrics, mm -hmm. significant growth failure and developmental, um, pubertal developmental delay. So I'd say that that remains in the background is how fast and how intense is the inflammatory burden. Taking that away, I then really look at disease location. It's interesting, mm -hmm. I actually think more about, less about is this Crohn's or UC in my decision making, it's where is the disease located? Is it a UC-like or is it a more superficial colonic type versus deep ulcerating small bowel? And the reason I note that is that, at least in my experience, um, vetalizumab, one of its sweet spots for me is really the colonic type or UC-like, so it may be more applicable in the UC discussion, but there are patients who have colonic uh, Crohn's that's more IBD unspecified, like IBDU, or scattered apthi and isn't responding 5-ASAs or intolerant. You know there's multiple types of sure. why patients show up. Um, versus a patient who has a more classic small bowel um, Crohn's disease, then I'm really talking about a patient who, for convenience, may want to focus on a self-injectable, meaning more of the sub-Qs. And that's where the discussions are becoming interesting, yep. which is adalimumab, for example, or sertilizumab versus ustekinumab, even though there's an IV induction times one, but what do patients want? Do they want an every eight week injectable? That is, doesn't, it's not painful, um, versus a Q2 week, possibly every one, depending on their response, and drug levels versus an every four week with sertilizumab. 
Or maybe they're like, I don't want to do any self-injection, and I'm deciding between infliximab and vedolizumab. So I kind of like, I really use the patient to help guide me as well. So, yeah. so it's interesting. It seems that, and I think that was really brought out in the case and the discussion we had with Corey, you and myself, that it's interesting that severity of disease, rapidity of onset in terms of agent, maybe that influences which you choose. Extent of disease, location of disease, patient preference on type of treatment that they would like. Um, and I think you also alluded to, at least in our discussion, that Vitalizumab does have the gut selectivity, so safety, yeah. there may be some also some considerations with that. So can I add that I'd yeah. say, for example, you just triggered my memory about the idea that, for example, in the uh, aging population, so advanced age, definition of that we're keeping <laughs> secret for both of our sakes, but the idea that maybe above 55 or 60, whereby risks of lymphoma may start to increase with thiopurines, risk of serious infection start to, risk with T start to increase with TNF. So maybe that's like a really nice time to introduce a gut selective, you know, integrin based therapy with vetalizumab. Right. So for the Crohn's patient who you worry about age or maybe some side effects, maybe Vito will have mm -hmm. and have potentially a unique uh, niche within that population. So let, let's switch gear. You did a really nice job of overviewing what's in the pipeline, what's to come for Crohn's disease. And tell us, what do you think or are, are, what are some key take home points that you would say from your talk that you gave in terms of what's next, how you position them, and just generally your thoughts? Sort of similar to what we talked to our patients about. Yep. It's like, let's get excited. We've got amazing drugs right now. We're still figuring out dosing and we're talking to them about how they want it delivered. And then all of a sudden we're talking about, is there going to be a time where there will be, TNF will not be first line. And I think we're all getting to that point, almost like we're saying, I think there'll be first line therapies will not be TNF, potentially. It's not a hundred percent. We'll have to see how it all, all looks. But the ones that people are most excited about is obviously the next generation of things we already may have. I'll take for example. So ustekinumab or Stellara, IL-1223. Um, I showed the Rizinkinumab data, right. which is the IL-23 only or the P19 uh, subunit as opposed to P40, which is the IL-12 and 23, and the idea that it's safety profile in psoriasis. Right, we have it, and some of the phase two data looks great, and we're entering phase three um, for Crohn's disease with rizinkinumab, so that's exciting. The phase two data looks really nice. The mucosal healing data, or the endoscopic healing or remission data, was nice, even as early as 12 weeks in some patients, and week 16 in others, because it was a mixed endpoint, and the clinical remission, obviously. So. One thing we do have to learn, which I always caution people, is that even though, for example, IL-23 is available for psoriasis with casilcomab, the dosing that is approved for psoriasis is not the dose for IBD. Correct. And we have historically learned our lesson with adalimumab when we used it for UC, for example. Dosing may be different from Crohn's. Ustekinumab, using it from psoriasis or psoriatic dosing and assuming that the Crohn's patient will respond to that kind of dosing, we know that that didn't work. So I always just, and I made sure to mention to the audience, just some caution, you know, don't get overexcited about using drugs from other indications. But for the purpose of Crohn's disease, it's a very exciting signal. And the safety profile of even ustekinumab, I think gets us excited about, about uh, IL-23 target only. And then the other target, which of course is exciting, is the JAK1 inhibitor. Right. Reason why I say it's in evolution is that we'll have tofacitinib hopefully in the spring. Uh, and as Corey mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit maybe in a minute about, uh, about uh, tofacitinib, but the idea that we're already moving like to the next generation of things yep. is kind of crazy and we don't even have them out, you know, so that's kind of interesting where I tell patients, yes, but in the future we'll have this and then after that we'll have that, what, you know, but distinguishing what's interesting is that tofacitinib is not approved for Crohn's disease and won't be coming out for Crohn's, but for UC only, yet these JAK1 inhibitors, we have two trials now that have been done in Crohn's, both filgotinib um, as well as ABT, um, 494, sorry, I 
the name Upa, it's like, I sound like I'm <laughs> cracking plates like at a Greek wedding Jack or something. One. Jack we one. get it. Um, the idea that that is already even more selective. So it's yep. exciting to imagine that we're moving more even selective. Beyond. Yeah. So I think it's, it's interesting with the um, aisle 23, Jack one, more selective. How would you position, so if you were to fast forward to the spring and beyond and say you now have, let's just say another Jack one inhibitor, mm -hmm. How would you position that for your Crohn's patient, knowing what you know from the trials and what you presented? So I think I think I have mixed emotion about how to position in Crohn's. I think in UC I'll have a more be permanent, easier um, and clear. Yeah, easier answer um, because we have such great effect of TNFs, for example. You know, it's changed people's lives, and the idea that am I going to get as much of a depth of mucosal healing? with these future targets. I think the phase three will help me position. But I think one thing that is clear is patients are going to want a pill. Sure. I think convenience, um, the ability to take something oral, the perceived safety, it doesn't mean that it is, but it's amazing how you know, you you talk to patients about you know IV, that sounds very serious. Right. Sub-Q, a little less so, but an oral, sure. great. Take, um, for example, a Tesla. It's or a Premolas, the most popular psoriasis treatment sure. right now. Doesn't mean it has the highest um, or the best outcomes, but it's convenient and perceived as safe. Right. And I'm sure it is, but I'm just saying, and this the idea that a pill, so when you look at patient benefit index, uh, which they've looked at in psoriasis, the convenience and the safety trump even 90% resolution of your psoriasis. That's a, that's a teaching point and, for me. And I think, so it's interesting as we transition to our discussion on ulcerative colitis, we have to take into account that oral medications will be more popular with our patients, but we still need to not lose track of the safety and the yeah. safety profile with these. So um, I think you did a wonderful job mm -hmm. summarizing the anti-TNF, the vetalizumab, the usakimumab, transitioning to future JAK1 and IL-23. Corey, Corey Siegel, talked a lot about ulcerative colitis. And um, I'll summarize what I, what I heard and, and a lot of the discussion the three of us had during the panel and not only in the case, that for ulcerative colitis, maybe a little bit different. About half the patients will respond to corticosteroids in five ASAs. It's that other half that we need biologics. And I think he did a nice job summarizing the anti-TNF data, showing definite rapidity of onset and durability but as you said, with Crohn's disease over time, there seems to be a loss with the anti-TNFs. Now we have vetalizumab, you already mentioned, I think it's a niche in terms of maybe older patients, safety is a, a benefit. It is given IV, so we need to take that into consideration. But really anti-TNF and vetalizumab. Now, what I think is exciting, and you mentioned tofacitimib, and to maybe pause on that for a minute, tofacitimib now is emerging as an oral. It would probably be 10 milligram twice a day as a pill. Mm -hmm. And a few things that I thought were interesting, talking about efficacy, and then we can talk about what potential safety, and, and I'll get your, your input on this as well. So I think key insights and key points on tofacitimib are this. One, it's oral. Two, it's rapid in onset. So it works very quickly in our ulcerative colitic patient. The third is that in the trials that were done in people who are on anti-TNF, which were about half coming into the tofacitimib trial, compared to those that were naive to anti-TNF, they really look the same. So this is, a, this is a small molecule where we're seeing high efficacy, even if somebody's already been on an anti-TNF, which is different than what we've seen in other studies with other medications. And at least through the first year, the durability of response seems to be very good. So I'm curious, Marla, as you think about um, the horizon of tofacitimib, maybe specifically for ulcerative colitis, how would you position it? Are you thinking first line, second line? What's, what's your thought process, knowing that this is, like you said, probably coming out pretty soon? Yeah. So a couple of interesting things. It reminded me when you said about sort of that the induction was agnostic to TNF failure or exposure or not. Right. Similar in the jack ones in Crohn's. So I, I wanted yep, to yep. add that aspect that as compared to what we see with uh, vetalizumab 
etrolizumab, which yep. is our other integrin-based therapy, as well as ustekinumab, things don't fare as well, both in the induction as well as maybe into the maintenance, if you have been exposed to TNF and multiple TNFs. Especially if your experience with anti-TNFs is not one, but two or certainly three, right. there's a drop off. Yeah. So interestingly about uh, tofacitinib in the UC is that again, it looks like it's agnostic to TNF exposure. What's interesting is that although in the trial, the separation of curves start around three weeks, but there was some data recently presented that when you look at daily diaries, even as early as three, three to five days, you start yeah. to see a separation. So going back to how we first started the discussion is how quickly do I need to see something work? That also will help me, you know, in the rapidity again of where am I going to place if I had anti-TNF, uh, vetalizumab, and I had tofacitinib in my hands, and that's like kind of where I'm thinking about soon right. I'm going to have these. If I have time, meaning if I have a patient with a more moderate left-sided colitis patient who's responsive to corticosteroids, a little bit steroid dependent, like around 15 milligrams, they start to flare. I think vedolizumab is an excellent option if a patient is not pushing you for an oral, for example, right. which will happen. They like the idea that it's a 30-minute infusion. Um, they don't need to be, at least doesn't look to be needing combination therapy right. with um, with vedolizumab, I should also mention the same with ustekinumab. It looks like as compared to TNFs, you don't need to have combo for immunogenicity sure. reasons. Okay. So in terms of uh, a hospitalized sick UC patient, I think infliximab still remains my go-to. Right. Um, so I think what's going to be interesting is if you have a patient who's failing infliximab in the hospital, are we going to start rolling tofacitinib out and say, yeah. all I need is three to five days, just stay here, take your by EID dosing, I'll be back. And, 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 and to be fair, those patients were excluded from the trial. 100%. So when this comes out, it probably won't be labeled yeah. for inpatient sick UC. Either is but, infliximab. But I was going to say we still use it. So I think for points of our discussion and practice, I agree, that's going to enter into the play. Um, and I think the, the question that I have for you with tofacitimib is in the patient who's, say, an outpatient, not in the hospital, not that sick, would you consider tofacitimib first-line therapy, forgetting the payment of it and the insurance implications? Yes. Um, the, I think not just because of it's convenient and patients are going to push. You know sure. the minute there's an oral and patients are going to come out, but the biology makes sense. So that's, and the fact that you have all your primary and secondary, you know, your primary right. secondary endpoints um, were met. and the rapidity of onset, which we talked about. So even in the outpatient who's on 40 milligrams of prednisone, has bad rectal symptoms, nothing's working, local therapy's not working, they fail TNF or not, even naive, we know that I think you're gonna get patients and ourselves who want to get patients better quickly, and you could get that with tofacitinib. Right. So I think that's gonna be helpful. Yeah, and I think so, so what I, what Corey had said, and I think from our discussion, I think tofacitimib is going to hit our practices in a very beneficial way early for our patients, both in those that may have already been on an anti-TNF, those that are naive to therapy. I think it, it's fair to say that generally the safety looks good, but mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out, and Corey did a nice job outlining, that this does increase cholesterol, both HDL and LDL, but it doesn't seem to cause or have led to significant cardiovascular events. But in fairness, that's something we need to figure out as mm -hmm. a gastroenterology community, how and if we're going to monitor cholesterol. Probably more importantly is the herpes zoster. And I know we had a discussion around that as well. And the question now with the herpes zoster, how do you, or what would you do for your patient who you're maybe considering tofacitimib knowing these potential adverse events. So it's interesting, you know, for we know that if someone has gotten the virus, so most of our adult patients had seen chickenpox maybe as a child, sure. that the virus is more virulent, meaning there's a higher chance that you could get shingles when you, instead of as opposed to getting the vaccine, where it's not as much of a rise of the viral right. load. So keeping that in mind, so when you are looking for whether a patient is immune to varicella or not as part of our checklist, for example, keeping in mind whether vaccinations have occurred and whether we should give boosters or not. I think that'll be an interesting also discussion just in the varicella world. 
But now that the discussion of zoster is really following the tofacid nib, yep. you know, it's like stuck to it. Let's kind of separate things a bit and say that, albeit yes, there was definitive signal. There's no two ways about it, whether you look at rheumatoid arthritis, even the psoriasis data, you right. know, um, during the trials and then the um, UC data. But I want to be realistic that this wasn't like disseminated zoster. Uh, relatively minor, single dermatome. Interestingly, happened more in uh, the Asian patients, yes. which I find interesting too, yep. so I'm trying to figure that out a little bit more about how to interpret that. And probably, I think, the nicest part about it is that the killed zoster vaccine, Shigarex, will be available, hopefully, hopefully also soon. soon. Right. But also important is that, although it, may, it will be approved for 50 and above, and maybe that's all that the payers will actually pay for. Glaxo is currently doing a trial in transplant patients above the age of 18. So that may help us actually yeah. start thinking about should we be vaccinating patients who are below what is normally considered the appropriate age? And should we as society say any patient is going to get on a jack? Because this isn't just tofacitinib, yeah, yeah. it's any jack, let's say. Will Should we have kind of if you're going to get it, we need to give you the right. zoster vaccine. Or, or you could argue any potential immunosuppression. Yeah. So we've seen it with steroids, we've seen it with thiopurine. So I think the idea of a zoster vaccine that's killed, using it earlier, certainly in our patients, and probably following cholesterol, we still need to stay tuned. But so far, that doesn't seem to be a signal that's a safety concern. Um, so maybe as we wrap this up, I, I think you know we had great conversations about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, old treatments, which now we consider anti-TNFs old, which is kind of interesting, yeah. and some of the new therapeutic targets. Um, what are maybe a couple of key take-home points that you have from this discussion for our audience and for clinicians out there? Yeah, I think as we all think about what this landscape is now and its moving parts and where things will will go in, in our algorithm, algorithms, I think probably one of the most important notes is that you need to segment your patient. Yep. You need to know what are the features of the patient that may benefit more from this therapeutic class versus another. You also need to know whether you have time. Because if you don't have time, that's certainly going to help you choose which patient you go to, a more rapid acting, even on the outpatient, not even extrapolating to the inpatient. Do you have a steroid bridge to something? If you have steroid refractory and the patient's sick, it means you're going to have to choose therapies a little quick, those that are more faster acting. Right? That's one thing I think is important. Know your customer. Understand the baseline risk. So does age influence? And one of the things we know is that the RA label will come with the UC label. Right. But RA patients are different than UC patients. And we will often, as we always do, extrapolate things from the wrong patient population just because the drug was given in another disease state. Psoriasis more closely matches our patient population. So don't over or under interpret safety, but I wanted to make that point that MACE may not be, or the cardiac events may not be as relevant to our patient population, although we measured it, as it would be in an older population, population, the RA patient. So these are kind of like pearls no, that I, 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 think, I think about. So, so I really thank you, Marla. That was excellent. A nice summary, uh, both in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And I think as we position these treatments, we're going to really need to personalize yeah. to our patient. As, and I think I said, as you said a minute ago, know your patient, know your patient well. Um, so, but on behalf of myself, on Marla Dubinsky, Corey Siegel, who was also involved in this program, we hope that you take away from these key insights on novel targets for IBD therapies. It's an exciting time in IBD. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. All of us are accessible by email or phone. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Have a good day.